about Someone to get you out The cops carried me down the stairs And I looked up to see your glare oh, I should have known If I give you all I have And heal the wounds of years This should be manageable It was only to put little boxes in an order along a grid Time's arc will remain constant there's no need for any gimmickry in the framework. It's a simple tale, an old common story, just one that fell through the cracks. In 1969, Heritage Records released a self-titled LP by a group called Euphoria. In 1969, Capitol Records ostensibly released an LP by a group called Euphoria, titled A Gift from Euphoria. Or was it a record by Hamilton Wesley Watt and William D. Lincoln? Hey, I want you. Hello there. I'd like to talk to you very seriously for a moment. In 1936, Spanish expat and music critic Philippe Altao had his first novel, Locos, A Comedy of Gestures, published as part of a Farrar and Reinhardt subscription series. It immediately went out of print and remained so for 58 years. Watt and Lincoln had been active in the Cleveland, LA, and Houston music scenes for a whirlwind three years before they began to track their self-produced, bank-loan-funded debut album. Tracked at Western Recorders and Sunset Sound in LA, Bradley's Barn in Nashville, and Pie Studio in London, the album is an unclassifiable and mercurial musical statement. Assisted by longtime drummer Dave Potter, Bobby Thompson, and Dave Briggs of Area Code 615, Lloyd Green on the heels of his Sweetheart of the Rodeo session, and a 70-piece section of the LA Philharmonic Orchestra, written for and conducted by Erwin Webb. The album was passed over by Apple Records before being picked up by Capitol when it tickled the follicles of the inner ears belonging to Nick Vinay. Right before its release, Vinay left Capitol for the second time, and the album moldered in the warehouses before a certain mulching. For 52 years, it's barely existed. This occurs more often than you might expect, so much so that even I know someone who experienced something very similar. Development hell exists across all forms of media, but at that stage, there's still hope for a positive outcome. Losing your tether post-release, it's as if the pilot has parachuted away right before cruising altitude.
the characters in the interconnected stories of Locos often act independently of the author-narrator, as well as frequently assuming different personas from tale to tale. In 2003, the Yugoslav expat Dubrovka Ugratia published Thank You for Not Reading, a kaleidoscopic collection of essays that investigate the space between the high and the lowbrow, the illusory nature of the market, and the disorientating tendrils of a life in exile. Oh, no, thanks. I'm not much of a reader. A Gift from Euphoria was imperfect as an object as it failed in the execution of its original intention, but it has been successful as a reincarnated cultural item. Its cultural value is derived from the circumstance of its failure as a commodified art project, not its success as a musical statement, just as its monetary value is rooted in its abandonment rather than being derived from a cultural good. Being on a major label, or even a bigger indie label, that is to say one with more than two or three employees, uh, requires uh, the need for an advocate. Um, despite appearances, not everyone at this label is going to be 100% on board with you and your vision. Uh, and there's a lot of cajoling and coaxing and convincing um, on your behalf that goes on behind the scenes by this advocate. Oh. Your destiny is in many ways in the hands of others. And when your advocate vacates their position or is fired or uh, moves to another project, you become rudderless. You fall through the cracks. And in industry terms, uh, you're damaged goods. There are deep veins of American music, with a seemingly endless amount of cracks to muzzle around in. The promise of continued fruitful harvests of forlorn scenes and wasted opportunities stems from our desire to both illuminate as well as unlock, but that promise is in jeopardy. As we lock the digital representation of music into standardized grids, everything becomes everything, frozen in that state of inception, a dizzying, unsubvertible endlessness. Such a stasis renders the entire circulatory system inert, as there's no longer need for any distinction beyond what would clearly be recognized as the high and the low. And in fact, those roles may currently be in the throes of a reversal. Something so binary has no use for sub-hierarchies, and the energy of those inner distinctions are lost to the void. When I wrote a book, I had a magnetophone, and 
euh, ou une platine euh, et j'écoute j'écoute It all starts in 1965, a very busy year for the future members of Euphoria, as William D. Lincoln shows up as the third wheel in the trio The Strangers, along with two future Walker brothers, John Mouse and Scott Engel. Later that year in Cleveland, the Bushmen are formed by Hamilton Wesley Watt and David Potter, who quickly relocate to LA where Lincoln joins the group. Buck Ram comes on as manager, and he sets the story moving into high gear by supplying The Platters, one of his biggest artists, with an A-side penned by Watt and Lincoln. Three singles then follow in short order, each under a different band name. Drawn to Houston in 1966 by the allure of the 13th floor elevators, the band renamed itself Euphoria, with only Watt and Potter carrying forward. They were joined by James Harrow and Peter Black from the Houston group The Misfits, who would later become Lost and Found. While in Texas, they cut one session, contemporaneous to the session for the first Elevators LP, which never yielded an album, before heading back to LA, where they recorded and released their first single as Euphoria. What's the matter? Do you like the music either? I like it fine. Harold and Black headed back to Texas, while Watt and Potter joined the Lee Michaels Band in 67 for a tour and the Carnival of Life sessions, though Potter is uncredited on the LP. Like certain characters in Locos, the stories of Watt and Lincoln and the Capitol album are a distortion in the way they're perceived with hindsight. Peripheral characters, once removed from what are already, mostly, rediscoverable tales, who decide at one point to make the narrative all about them. A year later with Lincoln back in tow, but Potter again strangely uncredited, Nick Vinay signed the band to Capitol Records with plans to release their recently completed self-produced album along with a two artist development deal. que le générique se déroulera non seulement au milieu du film, mais tout au long du film, se disait Daniel. If Nick Vinay is known at all, it's for his signings of the Beach Boys and Bobby Darin during his first run at Capitol in the early 60s. This is 
uh, hard work that somebody has to do. At least for uh, five of the uh, six Beach Boys cheerleaders. Mike rode with the cheerleaders. We start with Mike. The women all had definite opinions about their favorite Beach Boy tunes. Kokomo. But it's his second and less celebrated stint at the label that we're interested in. In 1967, he collaborated with Jimmy Bond, released as the West Coast Workshop, at a session that took place shortly before Bond produced and arranged strings for Jim Sullivan's UFO. Turn, face the man who's called you Rosie. Which Vinay passed on at Capitol, although it would have fit right in with his other acts. backyard you better turn your head around the other way drinking whiskey from the bottle won't help to erase the pain road to a Unlike Wilson, Usher, and Bechner's extravagances in the studio, Vinay seems by the late 60s to be rooted in a rougher, more naturalistic sound. baby right down into the muck nobody's gonna touch you because your hands are gonna be too far under nobody's gonna get dirty you got big plans what are you gonna finance them with nothing Those who presented themselves as disruptors of industries adopted a code of communication with the public via the media and its ancillary outlets to cast an illusion of them as institutions that have always been here, from time eternal, and with a modus operandi befitting systems with many more years of scars to show for their foreman. They purported themselves with an impotence that recalls Baudrillard's description of Ubu from Fatal Strategies.
but the replicating system which tries to disrupt learns its desires from the past systems, and so reforms into the selfsame thing it claimed to destroy. Rather than absorption and expansion like a series of nesting dolls, this disruption leaves us with multiple simultaneous ubus, layered and stacked one on top of another, each one the greater splendor of the void. Mister, you sure can talk. If you peruse the discography of Capitol Records, say, just in 1968 alone, it's a behemoth, at a time when it was just one of many such giants, both nationally and locally. The music available on a platform like Spotify in 2021 is like an endless electronic sea of sound, laid out in a grid to diminish the sonic and cultural distinctions, leaving the number of streams as the only true hierarchical indicator. Promotion is the difference maker in each system, both in 1969 and 2021. The main difference being that Capital had people like Vinay, whereas now, the artists themselves assume the role of both creator and marketer, and the corporations are ready to sell any number of imaginary solutions to a self-inflicted problem. We're trying to build tools. We're trying to build tools. Beach Boys historian Rob Finnis writes that in the early 60s, And what happens when you remove the cost of manufacturing, as well as the need to set up shop as a label? Where does that extra capital, the extra energy, wind up? What parts of the old system have we kept, and which have we lost? You're also working on your two-sided marketplace. Is there some... Um... Allowing artists to pay to promote their music on the platform. Revenue. Artists spend. Revenue. Promoting new releases. Revenue. And, and revenue. how much revenue. Revenue. Do you think that can drive? Revenue. The so-called gig economy, the dynamics of streaming, restaurants without a need for a physical presence, we're already knee-deep in the era of imaginary solutions. In Magnus Mill's 2003 novel The Scheme for Full Employment, there's a jobs program where people drive sprinter vans from depot to depot, delivering parts to repair the same sprinter vans. As more people are hired to drive, load and unload, do van repairs, depot maintenance, catering, management, the more depots open up, and the more interconnected the network gets. The illusory nature of the scheme, in regards to expansion, resembles the vast digital desert that currently makes up the bottom 99.92% .92 of the streaming ecosystem. Uh, le fait que quelque chose ne puisse plus s'échanger en valeur, ne plus plus trouver son équivalent et tout, fait que nous vivons dans un monde qui baigne dans une incertitude définitive. Sometimes it feels like they're insulting our intelligence. 
Is that deluxe reissue you just bought that advertises the holy grail of Parisian free jazz? Or Christian biker psych folk? Everything it was promised to be? You know, that sort of sickly sense that you're twisting above an, sort of abysmally too much of something. Is cult classic merely a code for work that has underperformed and in some cases underachieved? And what about those expensive deluxe reissues of ubiquitous, high-selling albums? Aren't there a box of original copies sitting across the store in the dollar bin? Do you know who that was? There is something noble about the excavation of work that would otherwise be lost. But in some ways, the museumification of culture is a campaign against modernity, its deadliest weapon a combination of nostalgia and fear of missing out. Those who curate and propagate these so-called artifacts are not necessarily sinister in intent. If they can be said to have an ideology at all, it is merely that of a devout adherence to market forces. But as we eternally celebrate what was missed or ignored, or in some cases, that with which we were already familiar, how do we avoid ignoring or resisting what's new? Is there room for new? In answer to your question, yes. Watch them, they have something to show you. Hear them, they have something to say. But the opposite of museumification is quite a leap into a kind of anarchic devotion to the arts that our current sensibilities are not tuned into. Perhaps for those who have lived across two eras, one decidedly analog, the new is simply a representation of everything that's come before, in form as well as access. Or is it that as new technologies present themselves at an incomprehensible pace, that act in itself is the new new? And amidst our distractions, the plastic pot has become as acceptable as the one made of clay. Three. Then I received a message that has been ringing in my ears ever since. Anything you'd like to check out? I have to admit that I found a gift from Euphoria for the first time on Soulseek over a decade and a half ago. And without randomly catching that loose tether, how would I have known to even look for it? Mais aussi, je sais que je suis déterminé par ce système technicien. When I found my vinyl copy at Amoeba years later, I assumed it was a bootleg. Why would Capital reissue something they had barely issued in the first place? It takes more than intellect to be a musician. Put your soul into it a little. A gift from Euphoria is commonly known as a psychedelic rock record. But the first one minute and 43 seconds are entirely orchestral until you finally hear a voice, almost whispering. Take
Quel charme ce film d'époque, hein, hein Quel charme The eccentricity of the album defies categorization. I can't understand why you like them. Uh, well, they got something going for them. They've got a sort of a sense of honor that I like. They just up and do the sort of things that a lot of people would like to be able to do. The album tells a sort of meta story, with segues and juxtapositions narrating the listening experience, as well as acting as a faux travelogue of the recording of the album itself. For example, Themes and Variations is an apt descriptor for Alfau's first novel, and A Gift from Euphoria shares as much of a literary feel as Locos does a musical one. Chase the girls and have a time, then I'll be home. The titular Lisa of the album's opener is not an ode of romantic love, but a devotional pen for a friend, the woman who secured the bank loan to fund the recording of the album. A character named Elsie shows up in more than one song. In the first, she's the scorner, the next, the scorned. The narrator of Lady Bedford offers to bring along a friend who sings and plays piano, while in the next song, Sweet Fanny Adams, he himself offers to play for Fanny, but only if she brings a friend along. There are multiple trains, planes, and a lot of love and rejection throughout the album, each sentiment delivered in the same dramatic, quivering voice that Watt and Lincoln both employ across the two sides. There's an almost mocking quality to the way the songs are sung that is rivaled by the sincerity and sobriety of the lyrics themselves. The contrast creates a tension, and there's magic when that energy rubs up against the grandeur of Irwin's score, or some of Watt's more searing guitar passages, or the organic thrum of the Nashville session, or the album's more abstract moments. It's magic! Pure, distilled magic! The eccentricity of a gift from Euphoria would seem to be a boon in the streaming era. Sadly, the album at this time is not available on any of the current platforms.
Some people are described as musical sponges. Watt and Lincoln are like musical flypaper. From the Walker Brothers to the elevators to the electrified folk music of L.A., they seem to bring some new element along with them from every scene they rub shoulders with. By the time they tracked a gift from Euphoria, they appear to be able to conjure a believably new take on any of them, but also with a kind of ecstatic detachment that seems impossible at such close range. Three short years from the Bushmen, Watt and Lincoln are mocking and or adoring not only contemporaneous musical tropes such as psych, country, and chamber pop, but also the avant-garde elements of the popular music scene. In 1970, Watt and Lincoln were involved in Bernie Schwartz's album, The Wheel, contributing production and musical assistance to both their own material, as well as a Terry Manning-esque take on Fred Neal's Candyman. Such was the extent of their production deal with Capitol. the generator. Don't move. The backup unit cuts in automatically. Now I'm going to counter with 100% yellow. Watt hangs on for a couple of years after the Capitol Sessions, contributing two songs to the Daniel Moore co-produced East Side Kids album in 1968, which featured Potter on drums before reuniting with him on Moore's own self-titled 1971 album. That same year, he shows up on Dory Previn's Mythical Kings and Iguanas, before disappearing into the northern Minnesota woodlands. listen, what's the use? The sparrow chirps, the chipmunk chapters, and we go on as mad as a hatter. You're letting some get away. Maybe they've learned something. Meanwhile, in 1970 and 71, Lincoln and his wife Linda recorded a full length under the name Addie Prey, titled Late for the Dance. It's just the going home is such a ride. Two years later, he showed up at Carnegie Hall backing up Previn and then traveled to Japan playing bass with Ventures spin-off Mel Taylor and the Dynamites. After living in different parts of the U.S., he eventually settled in Oregon and became an accountant. It's a living. Hello? 
Yeah, it's Euphoria. It's the, <clears throat> it's the middle section of Did You Get the... It's every sound in the world all pushed together to make one really terrific noise. No, it's, it's Did You Get the Letter, the middle section. It's a callback to part seven. What is it, a Martian hymn? Like I said, it's... Wait, why aren't you listening? Are you ignoring? I was tripping so out, see? I was off my head. Well, I see. Okay, fair enough. Well, as I said before, it's you. What the hell is that? I don't know. Something that's never been recorded. It was recorded in the late 60s. And well, what do you mean, what the hell is. I am sorry. What's wrong? Well, I guess they're not ready to play yet. I know that the world is going to come to an end in a year. Sometimes I'm dead then. What could have possessed that girl? See? The author is truly lost. I don't have any idea of what is happening. There's also work being done on the voice print, an electronic picture of the human voice. It's as good as getting your fingerprints. That's how distinctive your voice is. That has nothing at all to do with this video. I mean, maybe it would have worked in episode three. Look at this, my cosmic mirror. Now, an interesting note is that the angular moon was in conjunction with angular Neptune when Flight 19 was scheduled. When angular Mars is partile, opposition to angular Neptune, and square to angular Uranus, the double approaching... Shut up! I'm just a lot of talk. That's all I do. C'est un des aspects qui est très grave dans notre société, c'est que la technique ayant détruit tout ce que l'homme considérait ou appelait le sacré. It's just like life, you get the funny with the tragic.
And that's the tale of Euphoria, common in its day and seemingly ever since. But it's also a cautionary tale. What's the plot? Really? The plot is two 